I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of the 2020 Aykut Kent's Evolution Conference in Ankara for um, inviting me again to present um, a public lecture. I was um, lucky enough to be present in Ankara last year in 2020 and I'm delighted to be able to um, present another paper this year unfortunately only via, via this video link. Um, what I'd like to do in the short time I have um, available is to give a brief overview of some of the work that Charles Darwin did on the evolution of plants. And so I've called this lecture, A Walk in the Garden with Charles Darwin, um, the reasons for which will become evident um, as I go through the talk. So the key aims of this talk are, on the one hand, to celebrate Darwin's key ideas about evolution, and in particular to draw on what he learned about evolution from his study of plants, and more generally to celebrate plant diversity and the adaptations that one sees in plants all around us. Most plants on the planet are flowering plants. They have flowers that reproduce sexually by producing these absolutely amazing structures that we know as flowers and inflorescences. There are about 350,000 species of flowering plants. And one of our tasks as evolutionary biologists is to understand how this diversity came about and how these magnificent structures evolved. And Darwin played a very major role in setting the stage for much of the modern work that continues on both understanding floral and plant adaptations generally, and also this staggering diversification and speciation of plants that now cover the planet and occupy effectively all available habitats um, on Earth. If you look around you in gardens and um, florists and in the wild, you'll see the most beautiful um, structures associated with flowers and the um, reproductive parts of plants. This um, variation is the result of evolution, largely by natural selection. And as we will see, selection operating uh, on plant populations has brought about both very um, intricate adaptations that promote reproduction by allowing plants to produce seeds and disperse pollen, but also um, have led to and contributed to the diversification of plants. One of the things that I'd like to promote in this public lecture is the idea that one can actually learn quite a lot about plants, thinking about them um, in a different way than we might usually do, basically looking at them through Darwin's eyes, through considering how the particular strategies that we see, the different morphologies, um, shapes and colors may be the result of processes operating within populations due to natural selection. If we just take a very brief step back and consider Darwin's contribution to our understanding of ourselves and life on the planet um, <clears throat> in, in general, it's interesting to pose maybe a, a, the silly question as to whose contributions to our understanding of ourselves in the universe was more important, that of Albert Einstein or that of Charles Darwin. And of course, this is a silly comparison because both of these scientists um, made a huge impact on how we see ourselves. But the philosopher Daniel Dennett um, in his book, 
Darwin's dangerous idea actually came down in favor of Darwin as the more important um, scientist in terms of how, it, how um, his work affected our, our, our philosophical understanding of, of who we are and, and where we came from. And he writes, uh, the Darwinian revolution is both a scientific and a philosophical revolution and neither could have occurred without the other. If I were to give an award to the single best idea anyone has ever had, I'd give it to Darwin ahead of Newton or Einstein or anyone else. In a single stroke, the idea of evolution by natural selection unifies the realm of life, meaning, purpose, with the realm of space and time, cause and effect, mechanism and physical law. Now that's putting Darwin's work in a very broad context. What I'd like to um, emphasize in my talk here is the extent to which he's allowed us, he's opened our eyes to the function and the origin of many wonderful adaptations that um, we see around us. I think most people in the general public will think of Darwin as the person who worked on animals. Um, we may be familiar with pictures of variation amongst tortoises in the Galapagos Islands or Darwin's finches that evolved um, different ways of um, different beak, beak shapes to um, allow them to eat different types of seeds on different islands in the Galapagos. We might also be aware of the extensive work he did on invertebrates, for example, barnacles in the years leading up to the publication of The Origin of Species. And so certainly I think Darwin's, Darwin is best known as a zoologist, someone who understood and helped us to understand the origin of um, adaptations in animals. And of course, The Origin of Species, Darwin's most impor important book, draws heavily on examples that he um, examples that he drew from his his observations and from other people's observations of animals. However, within that same book, there are lots of examples um, drawn from the plant world. And it's very interesting, and I think generally unknown, that Darwin actually spent a great deal of his time, particularly after publishing The Origin of Species, in the later years of his life, working on plants. And in fact, he published six whole books on plants. Um, and these books were specifically and only on plants. And to this extent, one might actually consider Darwin certainly as much a botanist as a zoologist, although he was very modest about his botanical skills. This is the garden that we might like to walk around um, in with Darwin. The garden is in the surrounds of the house in which Darwin wrote The Origin of Species and all the later books that he wrote throughout the rest of his life. He moved to Down House a few years after returning from his voyages around the world on the Beagle. He first lived in London for several years and then sought a place in the countryside south of London where he could work without being disturbed. He had an office, he had a garden in which to roam and look at plants and animals. And he did a huge amount of experimental work here with plants. The images on this slide illustrate some of the places that would have been very influential to, um, on, on Darwin's work. The top left-hand image is the office in which he wrote his books. You can see a wheel, a, a, a chair on wheels. That is in fact the very chair in which Darwin sat and wrote his books. The desk is covered with implements in which he used to observe, uh, often under a microscope, plants and animals that he was studying and so on. Um, below it is a, is a photograph of what Darwin called his hothouse, or what we would call these days, <clears throat> a greenhouse or a glasshouse. 
he had this built for him so that he could study plants that were sent to him often from Kew Gardens in London. And he did a lot of experimental work here in addition to observations to try to understand plants and their adaptations. And the third image is in the grounds around his house. This is the path that he called the sand walk and Darwin would walk around this path several times a day, um, thinking, preparing to write in the afternoon and so on. So this is the world in which Darwin lived and worked and it was very much surrounded by plants and influence and his work was influenced by plants. And I think we can probably conclude that Darwin studied plants for three main re reasons. First was to bolster his theory of evolution by natural selection. So he used plants for evidence for the ideas that were central to his theory of evolution. He also studied plants because he was actually interested in understanding plants themselves, not only using them to understand the general features of evolution, but he used his ideas about evolution to understand plants and their adaptations. And thirdly, I think we could say that he studied plants because he loved them and um, he became incredibly fascinated by them increasingly as he <clears throat> matured as a scientist. And that started actually very early on in his scientific career. He was actually influenced by three, at least three people who were botanists. The first, perhaps not in terms of um, timing, but perhaps in terms of you know, intimacy, was his son, Francis. Um, Darwin worked directly with, with Francis at Down House. And in fact, they jointly published one of his six books on plants. And Francis was to become a botanist, a professor of botany at the University of Cambridge, where Darwin himself had studied um, some time later. So there was a, a very important um, collaboration that developed between Darwin and his son while they were at Down House. The second botanist that was incredibly important for Darwin's career was his friend Joseph Hooker, who became the director of Kew Gardens, the, um, the enormous uh, botanical garden in London. Hooker was important in many ways in Darwin's career. They exchanged an enormous number of letters. Um, Hooker was aware of Darwin's work on evolution and natural selection before the publication of The Origin of Species. He encouraged the publication of The Origin of Species after Darwin had received a letter from Wallace in which um, Wallace described having reached a similar um, idea of the idea, the idea of, of natural selection. And Hooker also used to send Darwin material, plant material from Kew Gardens to Down House so that Darwin could study it. So they were close friends and they exchanged scientific ideas throughout their scientific lives. And the third botanist I wanted to mention was in some ways, perhaps the most important of all. And this was his friend and mentor, John Stevens Henslow, who was the professor of botany at Cambridge while Darwin was a student there. Darwin moved to Cambridge to study theology, but he was quickly taken up with his interest in natural history, studying animals, um, invertebrates, but also plants. And he was very strongly influenced by Henslow in a number of ways. And I'll just mention a couple of them. One of them was that Henslow actually instructed Darwin into the importance of how to collect plants. And so I've just shown a, a, a photograph here of one of Henslow's um, herbarium sheets he showed Darwin how to collect plants, how to preserve them. 
And in fact, Darwin collected many plants during his voyages around the world on the Beagle and would send them back as specimens like this to Cambridge, um, to his mentor, um, Hensler. And there are many of Darwin's plant specimens now held at the University um, of Cambridge Botanical Garden and Herbarium. Um, the other thing that Henslow um, impressed upon Darwin, and I think this was incredibly important, was the, um, the fact that material should be collected that illustrated the variation within populations amongst individuals. And so you can see on this herbarium sheet, a number of individuals from a single population showing how much they varied. And Darwin was perhaps then made alert to the importance of variation amongst individuals in population, which of course is one of the most important aspects of um, the, um, the process of natural selection, the selection amongst individuals that differ in various different ways. And Henslow was perhaps influential in um, sharpening Darwin's eyes to this variation um, before he set off on his voyages. And then finally, it was Henslow, and I think this is obviously very critical, who strongly encouraged Darwin to travel on the Beagle. And <clears throat> this was a voyage that was hugely influential on Darwin's thinking uh, and provided him with all sorts of observations and examples um, when he came back to London with a very fertile mind um, that ultimately led to his idea of natural selection to explain diversification and the origin of species. So botanists played an incredibly important part throughout Darwin's life and it's not surprising that he spent so much time working with plants later on. So what is Darwinian evolution and how does it apply to plants? Well I think there are two key aspects that we might like to consider here and they concern how we might how we might understand the origin of diversity and the origin of adaptations. If you walk through a tropical forest, you see um, both of these features of, of plants, amazing adaptations of the flowers, leaves, shoots, the chemicals that they produce and so on, all of which ultimately is the result of selection, evolution by natural selection. And the very diversity that we see in, in tropical forests, the hundreds and hundreds of tree species that we find growing together, the plants growing on the trees, all occupying different niches and so on. This ecology in the tropical forests is the result of divergence between species in what Darwin would call the economy of nature. Um, and so I think these are the two themes that run through Darwin's work, understanding speciation, the origin of new species, and in plants, a huge number of species evolved um, via diversification, 350,000 of them, as I said, and these wonderful adaptations of different parts of plants, which Darwin was so fascinated by. And in understanding both of these aspects, it's always good to remember that plants, just like animals, all evolved and were derived from very simple organisms from the beginning. The original life on Earth was microbial, and both plants and animals evolved from these microbes via a process that involved modification as, as, uh, through, um, through variation being selected upon over countless generations. And there are two ways in which modification um, has been important. One is something that Darwin um, emphasized a great deal in his writing, and this was the idea of descent with modification. The fact that as we go from the left-hand side of this slide to the right-hand side, we see a leaf that over time has evolved from a simple um, form that might be um, found in ferns to a more advanced form that we find in flowering plants now. Over many, many generations, we get a modification of the same thing. So we're dealing both 
be dealing with leaves here, but the leaves themselves have been modified over time and advanced forms have descended from more primitive forms in the past. So this is the idea of descent with modification and that modification as Darwin, Darwin has taught us is the result of natural selection predominantly. And we should understand a great deal of the structures that we see in plants and animals as a result of modification of structures that came before. And so here are some examples of modified leaves. On the one, um, on the top left, we see maybe what we would call a simple leaf. And the other two images here are also leaves, but they've been heavily modified for new functions. And so both of, in, in both of these cases, there are different ways in which plants have evolved to capture insects and eat them. So these are different types of insectivorous or carnivorous plants that have evolved via the modification of leaves, presumably as a result of a long period of time where natural selection was operating under conditions where nitrogen was limiting plant growth. Here is another example of the modification of structures to produce or to come up with new functions. So on the left, we see a plant that is covered in hairs. On the right, we see a rose plant in which the hairs previously would have been just normal hairs have become modified into thorns. A lovely example of how natural selection has modified what came before to produce new structures with new functions. In this case, pres presumably to protect the plant from predators. The other way in which descent is important in Darwinian evolution is descent with diversification. And so this is not only the evolution of new structures over time, but the fact that different lineages can evolve into different directions. Um, in this particular case, we see two plants belonging to the same genus that have very different structures, but that have evolved over the last maybe 10 million years to become extremely different in how they are pollinated, their life histories, the ages that they reach and so on. And this diversification initially starts with an event of speciation and then these lineages gradually become divergent over time. The idea of descent with diversification is captured in these two figures. Both of them are very famous. The first on the left is the only figure that we find in Darwin's Origin of Species, where he sketches out the way in which populations and then species and higher taxonomic groups become divergent as a result of this bifurcating of a type of tree, what we call a phylogenetic tree. And on the right is an image of a sketch from one of Darwin's notebooks in which he first sketches out how lineages will split and lead to different, um, different ultimately different species that, are, that occupy different um, places in the economy of nature, different niches as we would call today. So those are Darwin's broad ideas. How um, can we apply these to plants or how did plants influence Darwin's thinking? And indeed, what were the six books I referred to that Plant wrote about plants? Well, we can divide his six books perhaps into two um, triplets. There were three books that he wrote um, on plants, I think influenced by a search for the animal nature of plants, a fascination for similarities between plants and animals, and three books that he wrote on plant reproduction. So I'll just run through these and just give you a very brief taste of the sorts of things that he, he wrote about in these books. So to start with these three books on what I've called here, the animal nature of plants. And the first one was indeed about the, insect, the, the, the carnivorous plants that fascinated Darwin enormously, insectivorous plants. These are plants that have evolved modifications 
such that they can actually eat plants. Usually we think of, sorry, eat animals. Usually we think of animals eating plants, but of course many plants have evolved ways of, cap or of, of catching and then digesting animals. And we've just seen a couple of examples of that in one of my previous slides. Darwin did lots of experiments with carnivorous plants. He had them growing in his hothouse and um, he did many measurements of how their different um, parts moved and how the, um, the plants were able to digest insects. And he would feed the plants with different types of insects and other types of materials to see how plants behaved. He was so fascinated by them and he became almost obsessed, it seems, that his wife said about them, his wife Emma, at present he is treating Drosera, that's the plant you can see on this slide here, he is treating Drosera just like a living creature, presumably she means an animal here, and I suppose he hopes to end improving it to be an animal. The second book that Darwin wrote about um, plants was the power of movement in plants. So here again, he's choosing an aspect of plants that we normally associate with animals, the fact, the, the, the idea of movement. And this is the book that he co-authored with his son, the botanist, Francis Darwin. And in this book, you will find um, intricate diagrams such as these um, on, the, on these two pages, where Darwin and Francis observed plants over often quite short periods of time, overnight, or under different circumstances, and saw how their shoots and their leaves moved um, in response to either endogenous signals, signals that they were getting from their own physiology, or in response to um, signals such as light, gravity, um, touch, and so on. Darwin then also wrote three books on plant sexual reproduction. So plant reproduction through their flowers. The first of these was a book that he entitled The Various Contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects. This is essentially a book on orchids and on the adaptations that orchids have evolved to promote outcrossing. In other words, to promote the transfer of pollen from one flower to another or from one individual to another to bring about gene flow. Darwin wouldn't have used that term, but to bring about the crossing of individuals within populations. And this book is um, illustrated by beautiful drawings of orchids, which are incredibly advanced flowers, highly modified flowers, and the various adaptations that they have evolved to present their pollen and receive their pollen as a result of visits by insects. And on the right hand side, there is an illustration um, in Darwin's book in which he's showing how a particular part of an orchid flower called the pollinium where pollen is held um, is stuck onto normally it would be an insect that enters into the flower. Darwin inserted pencils into the flowers and he found that over a short period of time it would correspond to the time it would take for an insect to flower from one to fly from one flower to another. This little structure actually moved such that it was going to be then well placed to deposit pollen in the next flower that the insect visited. And I thought I would read this um, wonderful quote from Darwin's book about orchids because I think it illustrates the extent to which he was um, influenced by his study of, of plants. He says, the more I study nature and plants, presumably, because this was in his plant book, the more I become impressed with ever increasing force with the conclusion that the contrivances and beautiful adaptations slowly acquired through each part, occasionally varying in a slight degree in many ways with the preservation or natural selection of those variations which are beneficial to the organism under the complex and ever varying conditions of life 
transcend in an incomparable degree the contrivances and adaptations which the most fertile imagination of the most imaginative man could suggest with unlimited time at his disposal. What Darwin is basically suggesting here is that natural selection is much more creative at coming up with new ideas, new, new um, ways to meet challenges presented to them, um, presented to organisms, than human beings are at coming up with ideas to solve problems. So natural selection is a great problem solver and a very creative one. The third book that Darwin wrote about plants was on the effects of cross and self-fertilization. And so this obviously has some links to his book on orchids. Um, in this book, Darwin considered the effects of self-fertilization or cross-fertilization of plants. And the other book that he wrote on um, plant reproduction um, was on the different forms of flowers on plants with the same species. So for, so for example, this would, this would be cases where plants are not just hermaphroditic, but you have males and females in the same population, or you have plants that have um, flowers that differ from one individual to the other. And I'll say a, a little bit more about this in a moment, but I think these two books are quite closely linked in many ways. Um, uh, and so perhaps we could just think about what most plants are like and how they have become modified um, by selection to uh, promote or avoid self-fertilization. Most flowering plants are hermaphroditic. In other words, they have both male and female parts. And if you ask a university or a school student who's not thought too much about plants before, why most plants are hermaphroditic. The answer that you'll normally get is that there is an obvious advantage to hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites can self-fertilize. And of course, plants are sessile organisms. They can't move around like animals can. And so it would be a big advantage to be able to self-fertilize. So that is one of the key hypotheses for the evolution of self-fertilization in, in plants. However, and, 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 and as I say, because plants can't move, an ability to self-fertilize would be an advantage in many situations, like in this particular case here, where you might have a plant sitting in the middle of the desert with few other individuals to mate with. An ability to self-fertilize in this situation would clearly be an advantage. However, most plants do everything they can to avoid self-fertilization. And Darwin's work helped us to understand why. He did experiments where he took plants in his hothouse and crossed them either with themselves, so he brought about self-fertilization, or crossed them with other individuals. And then he compared the vitality, the growth of the progeny, the seeds that would result from these crosses. And he found again and again, and these are just two pages taken from that book, um, where he documented the fact that the self-fertilized plants tended to be much weaker than the outcrossed plants. In other words, <clears throat> self-fertilization somehow was detrimental to plants. Darwin didn't understand the genetics of it, but he did understand that self-fertilization would be detrimental. We understand the genetics now, and we've confirmed Darwin's um, observations again and again in many, many studies that have been done similar to those that Darwin made with a better understanding of the genetics now. Um, but Darwin was absolutely right to predict that nature should select for mechanisms that would, in many cases, avoid self-fertilization because selfing would be bad for plants. Um, and indeed bad for animals. So what are those ways in which plants have actually um, evolved to promote outcrossing? Well, there are thousands and thousands of different ways in which plants have evolved to promote outcrossing. I'll just give you a couple of 
examples here. I'll start with just reminding you what a normal flower looks like, um, where you have petals that attract pollinators, you have male plant parts, which are called the stamens, um, that pre present the pollen usually to insects. And then in the middle of the flower, the hermaphroditic flower, you have the female part on which pollen is deposited and eventually the production of seeds occurs in the ovary, which turns into the fruits that we often eat. So that's what a usual, you know, normal, typical hermaphroditic flower looks like. And this structure has been modified in all sorts of ways to promote outcrossing. One of the cases that Darwin was very interested in, and in fact, as I've quoted him here in the bottom of the slide, <clears throat> he notes that he didn't think that anything in his scientific career had given him so much satisfaction as making out the meaning of the structure of heterostyled flowers. These are flowers that are all hermaphroditic, but the position of the stigma and the anthers differs between individuals. So in half the population, the stigma is at the top of the flower. That's the female, fun the female part and the male parts are halfway down in the flower. Whereas in the other half of the population, we see the reverse scenario with the male parts at the top of the flower and the female parts at the bottom of the flower. And Darwin was able to show and at least hypothesize that this particular strategy, this wonderful um, polymorphism had evolved almost certainly under selection to promote outcrossing more efficient pollen transfer between plants of different individuals. <clears throat> this is an example of a genus that Darwin had not studied and a beautiful strategy that has been um, studied more recently called flexistyly, where we find two individuals or two classes of individual in the same population, again, in which the male and the female parts are placed in different positions. So on the left, we see a plant where the female part is poking up towards the top and the male part, the stamens are below. And so when an insect in enters the pollen, in in enters the flower, pollen will be deposited on the back of the insect. Whereas in the other flowers, on the right, the other class of individuals, when the plant, when the pollinator enters these flowers, the female part is um, hanging down and will pick up pollen on the back of the insect. And the male parts above have not yet opened and released their, um, their pollen. And so what we see here is both the spatial separation of the sexes within the flower, but also the temporal separation because the flower on the left will eventually become the flower on the right. And this process occurs during um, changes over the course of a single day. The change occurs between these two different types at the middle of the day. So in the, in the, um, <clears throat> in the morning, um, the flower on the right would be as we see it. And in the afternoon, it would look like the flower on the left. And so we see an example again of the movement of pollen of, of floral parts. Um, I'm going to show you here some, some slides by photographs by um, some colleagues of mine um, who have shown how this process actually occurs over the space of a single day in a different species of the same genus here. So this is nine o'clock in the morning. We soon see an example of these of two, of two flowers from, from the different um, classes in the population. And so the one on the left is in its female phase. You can see the female part hanging down. On the right, the plant is in its male phase and the female part is held above, um, out of the way of the pollinators. And you can see the pollen is already being presented to pollinators that might enter into the flower seeking nectar. And so we can now see what happens as the plant, um, as the day progresses. So I'll just go through this is now as the morning progresses, you can see now the female part on the right is dropping down, the female part on the left is moving out of the way. And at about midday, you can now see that on the left, the pollen is going to be presented. So the anthers are opening up and you can see lots of pollen here. 
being um, presented to the pollinators. And so this is a process that occurs over the space of the day and at the end of the day, both of the flowers collapse and this process would start again with fresh flowers the next day. This is something that is called um, flexi style. It's a wonderful adaptation that Darwin would have absolutely loved. My final point is an interesting one concerning the function of flowers and the function of plants and how our view of these flowers has changed over time. So I would say that until a few decades ago, plant ecologists in particular would think of, you know, would consider plants from a demographic point of view as being important in the production of seeds and that plant demographic De demographic dynamics involved the production of seeds and seed germination to produce new flowers. And in fact, the great population, plant population um, biologist, John Harper, wrote in his book published in 1977, a plant is the only means with which a seed produces more seeds. And it does so by means of its flowers. So one can see here a very seed centric or female centric view of the function of flowers. That flowers are there to produce seeds and, that's, and, and seeds produce plants so that more seeds can be produced. However, this view misses out on an important function of flowers. And that is <clears throat> that they also produce pollen. Pollen, and not, not just seeds, but also pollen, transmits genes to the next generation. And in fact, half the fitness of hermaphroditic plants comes through their production of pollen. And so we can ask the, ask the question, to what extent are the adaptations we see in flowers the result of competition amongst individuals for mating success through their male function? This is what we would call sexual selection. In other words, competition amongst the male component for fertilization success, sexual selection. Can we understand flowers as the result of the process of sexual selection and not just natural selection? Well, interestingly, Darwin is the um, scientist who first introduced the idea of sexual selection, and he wrote a whole book about um, sexual selection, the descent of man and selection in relation to sex. And in that book, he explained um, how we might find a divergence in the morphology between males and females in animals. For example, on the left, we see a photograph of peacocks where the peacock is advertising to the peahen. This difference between males and females is the result of sexual selection. Darwin, interestingly, did not think that plants would ever be subject to this process of sexual selection because of course, plants cannot choose their partners in the same way that animals can. However, we now know that plants are subject to sexual selection, particularly competition amongst males for fertilizing females. And many of the wonderful structures that we see in, in flowers and inflorescences such as the image that I've shown in the right here with these strange bracts are probably the result of strong selection to attract pollinators, to be better attractors of pollinators and to promote male reproductive success. And so I think that's where I'd like to end this lecture is to show that plants and many of the, uh, or at least to suggest that plants and many of the structures they have are the result of selection via natural selection but also selection via sexual selection. And many of the ideas, although Darwin would not have called that sexual selection, do go back to Darwin and the several books that he wrote on plants. And so I will end my lecture there. Um, and um, thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>